Reporting on the games you love by people who love to game. The MMO Reporter Network. You're listening to Guild Wars Reporter on the MMO Reporter Network. Brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at audibletrial.com slash MMO Reporter. And by Doghouse Systems. Choose your weapon at doghousesystems.com. This is episode 97. I am Celeste, and I am, as always, I am joined by the lovely Alona. Hello. I decided that I would go ahead and say your name this week. That's fine. I actually prefer that rather than saying my own name for some reason. Because we, you know, the whole issue. Yes, our combined names. Yeah. Which I have taken to the next level. <gasps> she did. I made a thief. A thief? A th- <laughs> I thiefed it. You thiefed it? You made a thief named Salona. Salona. And the last name is probably not right, but I tried. It's supposed to mean uh, report in German, because reporter didn't finish. Fit. Wow, didn't fit. So it's bericht, I think. I don't know how to say it. I'm sorry. I'm terrible. Yeah, Making I'm character not... names that I can't even say. <laughs> <laughs> it's the thought that counts, and it was very cool. Yeah. She looks pretty awesome. So even if the name was wrong, I'd probably be like, meh. <laughs> can't get the name right, can't pro- pronounce the profession. I'm totally pro. That's just Actually, how it goes here. That was from chat room. Calling us out on our professionalism. <laughs> yeah. There's so that's much. one of the things you did this week. Uh, Actually, I made her like two shh, weeks ago. Shh, but... Part of this week. Shh. Yeah, it was part of this week. So, uh, let's go ahead and, and go through what you did in game this week. Well, in an effort to start doing the spinal blades, I have need to harvest all the iron because <laughs> I made all my iron into ingots and happily made my back piece, the spinal blade back piece. And then I realized that the next thing you need to do was steel. And I just <laughs> ingoted all of yeah. my iron. <laughs> And I looked at the price of iron on the trading post and went, yeah, that's not happening. So I basically ran around Blood Tide and Brisbane Wildlands and harvested as much iron as I could. Brisbane's actually really good. I watched, a, there was a YouTube video in kind of like Northwest Corner. Mm-hmm. There's like two or three rich iron veins, like fairly close together on the west side. Yeah, it's really good, actually. Yeah, I didn't know about that. But now I do because I needed the iron. You mean the area with the earth elementals and the kind of canyon thing? Yeah. There's yeah. That, and then there was a rich one where that evil bandit boss is, which I took down by myself. Granted, I was on my 80, but still. I'm not good at soloing bosses like some people. Yeah, Hunter is suggesting Terra Corunda in Blaze Ridge. Ooh. And Fields of Ruin is also good for iron as well. Yeah, I had really good luck uh, running around Blood Tide for it the one night. I actually really like Blood Tide for some reason. Then, of course, I've been trying to save the citizens of Lion's Arch. I've stopped that just to get like the couple escorts that I still needed. And I need to go through and still actively hunt down for the 30 Piles of Rubble Mm -hmm. achievement. But other than that, I have all the meta done and everything else done on that. I, I have a hard time finding citizens. Like, I, I go where I know I've seen them, and I either just run up as I see them running to the exits because someone else has got them, so they're not... Like, I just... I end up running in circles a lot. The one night, I ran around or with some guildies to harvest Tier 6 mats and relax because it was like a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> compared to doing LA all the time? Compared to Lion's Arch, it's like, this is so relaxing. <laughs> Well, all I did was Lion's Arch, um, and more Lion's Arch, and Lion's Arch by myself, and Lion's Arch with friends, and Lion's Arch. Actually, since the beginning of the week, today was the first day I'd gone back in Lion's Arch. (laughs) Did you just, like, OD on it over the weekend? I think I must have, because I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna go in without me. I'll be here. (laughs) 
Saint was just saying, we've talked about in the guild, he knows where all the pals of Rebel are, so he's going to do a uh, tour, a Rebel tour. Ooh, I'll go on that tour. He's a really good tour guide. He remembers jumping puzzles, and he's got a good sense of direction. I do not, so he's good to have around for that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, then sign me up for that, because I still only have like 10, I think. I've looked at the map a billion times, but I just never go to the right places. Yeah, I have 17. But I I know I keep hitting the exact same ones over and over and over again. So clearly there's a bunch I'm missing. We're just going to have to go on the the patented tour. TM. The what we did this week was kind of brief, which is good because (laughs) (laughs) the news is very long. long. Report from Vigil Key. Dark days for Lion's Arch. All is ash and ruin. And destruction reigns supreme. Now is the hour of our greatest need. To all of you who hold Tyria dear and call it home, Time has come to gather as one and take back Lion's Arch in the name of freedom. So that was the most recent teaser trailer for the next patch, which is Battle for Lion's Arch from ArenaNet. And the bottom of the YouTube page, they had the comment, it's time to take back Lion's Arch from Scarlet's armies on March 4th. Battle for Lion's Arch is the climactic ending to the epic season one of the Guild Wars 2 living world. Don't miss the chance to change the face of Tyria forever. Bum, bum, bum. I'm excited, but I really, really hope that Lion's Arch is not going to be destroyed forever. Well, you remember last week, the one thing that they said, for a time. Like, they specifically yeah. used the words for a for time. A time. So, so unless they were, you know, completely fibbing, which, yeah, I guess that would be... That'd be pretty snaky, but it's possible. <laughs> it's possible. I can't imagine they would destroy it forever. I can't imagine that they would either, but I figure it's still in the realm of possibilities, so I'm, you know, apprehensive. Yeah. And because we no longer seem to get the preview page, (laughs) which I'm of two minds. I miss it, but I kind of like the discovery right at the beginning of of patch day. It is nice not to know, you know, a week in advance what's going to be happening just because you've read what the rewards are. Yeah. So I'm of two minds about that. Guild Wars Hub put up a brief synopsis of things that top thing six things to do this week before the next patch. And one of them was gather spinal blade blueprint scraps and blade shards. And they were suggesting to save your extras because they might sell well after the end of the season. Mm-hmm. That never occurred to me. They did point out that you may be able to get, if not the scraps, the shards at some point. It's possible that it could still drop in the next patch, the shards. Well, the shards for sure, but I I think she means more before the end of, or he or she, whoever wrote the article, before the end of the... Living world. Yeah, the living world. Now, who knows, you might end up with a a mining node in your home instance to get blade shards. (laughs) (laughs) And and for the people that have like 900 of them, I'm sorry. (laughs) Yeah. I thought, wow, that never, that's a good point. That never occurred to me. So I actually, when I was last in the game, I, I went to the guild bank and took out all the blueprint scraps that I'd put in. Because <laughs> so I went, yeah, I might need these. <laughs> if nothing else, it's like a really cheap way to get exotic. Well, yeah. So I can understand, you know, wanting to go ahead and keep them and then saving a couple of sets of at least, I guess it's the scraps that you use, the four scraps. The sharp, yeah, the scraps. And you need shards as well. But to go ahead and make like the base pieces for your low level alts and then slowly build it up. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering is because it's at what point is it not account bound when you make it, it's account bound. 
when I made mine, I was trying to put it in the bank and I was trying to preview it or something like that. And I actually right click and hit equip Mm -hmm. and I unequipped it and it was still account bound. Okay. Up to what level are you though? It was on Solana. I think it was like level two. So I don't know. (laughs) No, I mean like, were you? Oh, it was the base. base? Okay. Yeah. So I'm wondering at what point of adding the blade shards, does it become not account bound? I It's probably out there somewhere, but I, I have no idea. In any event, the number two thing to do is make sure you have endless quagon tonics, especially the endless mystery quagon tonics, because they will probably sell for a huge amount at some point within the next year. They're suggesting to buy them if you ha- haven't had them drop, sit on them, and step three, profit. I bought my endless mystery tonic for a little bit more than I'd like, but I'm probably not going to sell it. I bought it for me. Yeah. I I understand where they're coming from. It it makes sense to go ahead and buy this sort of stuff for profit later on. Mm -hmm. They also have the suggestion to go ahead and get yourself the selfless or thoughtless potion. And I was uh, not crazy about it after I had read the wiki entry, which made it seem like it was a one use thing, but it's actually like an everlasting tonic. It is. I just don't particularly care for the appearance of either of them. Like, I mean, they're okay. Well, I've heard that they clip really badly with certain hairstyles and certain helmets and all kinds of stuff so it's kind of like meh. yeah what was it the afro azurans it gets completely hidden by their afro <laughs> that's <laughs> i think i read that somewhere <laughs> but yeah i just as much as i love the halo in guild wars one this one is like eh. and i already have like the actual town clothes horns that you could get yeah me too so i'm like eh, meh the fourth thing was uh, don't forget to spend your found belongings, which I'm still trying to figure out what I want to use them on. I think and I'm going to take their suggestion and go ahead and get Tomes of Knowledge oh. and just do that and like super level. Oh, well, you see, I'm not a big fan of the Tomes of Knowledge. So for me personally, it's an easy way to gain a couple of levels. Like when you hit that mid 40 slump, just pop all of those. <laughs> Maybe. I guess I've never really noticed the slump. I have a tendency to fall into that real is, badly. Is it just a boost of 20, 20 levels? I thought it was just a boost to level 20. So if you go ahead and use it, you'll gain an entire level. So like if you are in a leveling slump. Oh, or for dailies when it's like leveler. It's pretty handy. Okay, well, that makes sense. I, I don't really have anything else to spend my fan belongings on that I think are um, attractive. Mm-hmm. So it's it'll work out for me in the end. Well, I obviously was misunderstanding what the tomes did, so I agree that I changed. I'm changing my answer to yeah, tomes of knowledge. The second to last item that they suggest you is to prepare for the fight, and I'm actually just going to read exactly what they've posted here. This is the big finale for season one Living World stories. You can bet your butt that there will be some grand epic fight that will put you through a challenge or two. So let us also consider the fact that they have already said that will we be fighting. And who do you think we're going to fight at the end? Scarlet. Make sure you have a character you are completely comfortable with in a tough fight, and preferably as best geared out as they can be. Also wouldn't hurt to make sure you have good food consumables for the fight. Something tells me we're going to be pit up against some difficult fights in our attempt to retake Lion's Arch. And I think that's some really good advice, actually. Yep. That just have your one character that this is who I'm taking in, at least. And Cooks, it's time to make some profit. Actually, I'm wondering about the potions of fighting Scarlet's army's good, if those will work against Scarlet as well. They should. It would be odd if they didn't actually. Yeah. The last suggestion that they offer up is to go ahead and get as many black line keys as possible. Yep. yep. They say this is their big grand finale and they are probably going to do all the biggest features they can think up. It would be kind of neat if they just like... Everything from the past living world that was available for a period of time in the chests, they're all available at some chance. That'd be pretty cool, actually. Yeah. I mean, bear in mind, we don't know if this is happening or not. That's just yeah. expected. It'd be a big roulette, but it'd be mm-hmm. interesting to see. Yeah. And you posted an interesting link into our show notes. Yeah, just simply by the name of Battle of Lion's Arch. It brought back memories of Guild Wars 1 and the Warren Crita and all the rest of it and trying to finish up that ridiculous quest. Yes. And (laughs) honestly, I just feel like I really hope that this finale is as fulfilling as the Guild Wars 1 quest. I want to be able to be like, yes, I finally got it. Yeah, 
I just, I had trauma flash flashbacks when I went to that page <laughs> because that battle probably took me almost a, a month. Now, granted, only playing once or twice a week, but <laughs> it took a really long time to get it. And I actually, when I was at the page, I added everything up and there were 392 foes plus 11 bosses in a series of waves. <laughs> like, no wonder. And granted, you had 660 NPCs that could help you, but they were spread out all over the place. So and it was they basic died a and lot. They, they died a lot. They died quickly. So it was your team of eight against 392 foes plus 11 bosses. So no wonder I was a bit traumatized by that. But yes, it was very satisfying when you finished it. Yes. I'm just hoping for that kind of payout. So another thing that was added to, well, I guess not really to the game, but as a tool to <laughs> go through the living story, I use the term tool loosely. Or alternately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't understand this. Well, okay. I understand what they were trying to do, maybe. Are you going to say what it is, though? Oh, the Atlas. <laughs> I'm showing it on the stream. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I got all cut up with that. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about the Tyrian Atlas, where you can go and type in secret coordinates yeah. to find... Oh, you can type them in? Yes. Okay, because I was like going back and forth between tabs and moving my, my mouse cursor and watching the thing. <laughs> I didn't you know. chose the hardest way possible. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> okay. That's... <laughs> yes, you can sad. type into the little coordinates thing on the side. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good. That's better than the way I was doing it. And yeah, you'll get secret pop-ups on occasion. It's cool. I feel like this is incomplete. Like, there isn't enough content here to make it useful. I think this isn't necessarily for people who've been playing it all the way through. No, I understand. But I think that even if I had come into this blind and all I saw was these little points, I wouldn't understand what was happening fully. I was actually kind of confused and lost for the first few minutes when I was they're like, okay, what is this? What's happening here? I don't understand what the point of this is. But I eventually did kind of. I'm not, I'm not sure how much I would actually use it. But it's kind of neat. It's, an, it's interesting. It is interesting. I hope that there's a lot more later on. Yeah. You made a note that you just want them to make an app. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. In the notes, I was just like, this is bovine excrement. Just give me an app. <laughs> because that, that was like, I still wistfully think about the app that they had talked about pre-beta that would allow you to check the online status of your guildies. And also you could take part in guild chat from your phone. That's all I want. Oh, I still think about that on occasion. That would be nice. If they could make something like that work, just HTML5 and have it work. I mean, okay, I know. I'm, I'm such a big coder. I know all this. <laughs> but... I mean, like, if they could do that, I'd be good. Yeah. Honestly, I think the map that is uh, put together by that shaman. Oh, he did that one. The legacy sites overlaid on, on the Guild Wars 2 is just much cooler. I have to admit, I probably spent half an hour to 45 minutes just cycling, scrolling through that up close. Yeah, I honestly feel like, okay, it might just be because we're Guild Wars 1 nerds, but yeah, yeah it's just good. Yeah. One of our other stories that we were following this week was on the forums. They posted a Q&A about the Glory Boosters. Well, gl about Glory in general, but we call this Glory Booster Gate yes. because the Glory Boosters are a big deal for me. Yeah. <laughs> what was said was, why aren't people with Glory Boosters being compensated with different boosters or something along those lines? And I think it was Allie was doing the replying. She said, uh, we will not be converting glory boosters because we announced that we would be phasing out glory in John's blog post, and it wouldn't be fair to the players that used all their boosters up since then in preparation for it. However, players that spent gems to purchase glory boosters directly will be eligible for a refund. For those that did purchase them, they can file a ticket here. To which I say, no. The people who used them benefited by boosting their PvP glory, and thus they got rewards. It would be completely fair to allow people who didn't use the boosters to convert them to something else. Because I received my boosters as part of my achievement chests, and not letting me convert them is saying my achievements weren't worth, it, worth, worth as much as someone who got, gets the chests past that date. My last chest, I got a PvP glory booster. And it was after the blog post. 
if I hadn't received the boosters at all, their spot in the chest would have been replaced by something else that I probably would have used. Right. Anyway, and actually, um, because I kind of stated this sort of thing on Twitter as well, and I got a re- there was a reply from GW2 Lexi, and she pointed out, and what about of those who have boosters from Black Lion chests, etc., but never PvP? She wouldn't mind converting hers. And I was like, well, th- and that's true too. Like, what about people who got the glory boosters from buying keys? They bought keys, opened the chest, got a PvP glory booster. Does that count as someone who bought them with gems? Well, it, it kind of goes into the whole RNG thing. and it, I know. I mean, it's but... the same sort of thing with the achievement chest. There's a lot of, I mean, I could go either way on this. Do I feel like it's not fair that I got a glory booster when they already knew glory boosters were going away and that glory was going away? Yes. But the ones that I had before, yes, I had the opportunity to use them. Did I? No. Yeah, and Hunter's insight in chat is saying not everything in the achievement chests are going to be used by everyone. But I, I, st- I still think like even a two to one trade in could be fair. I think that when they had posted that blog post and they said that glory was going away and that everybody needed to spend it, they should have taken it out of the loot table for achievement and black line. That's chests. true. That is fair. That that would have been fair. I guess my main issue with the reply is that it wouldn't be fair to the players that use them. I'm like, how is no? If you use them, you gain the benefits of them. You boosted your glory. Yeah. (laughs) I'm like, I'm not sure how this works then. It's a fair point to be made. If I hadn't got those, I would have got something else, like a speed booster or... A crafting booster or something else that would have been equally useful. You know, obviously not something that's going away. There. End of rant. (laughs) It was a very light Canadian rant. (laughs) So let's go ahead and jump over to the answers for the characters and relationships in Tyria, Dolyak Express. Uh, A few of the questions that came through I thought were pretty good. Mm -hmm. For example, are there relationships between races in Tyria? We know of Bram and Rox, but is such a thing more common in or such a thing more common or the rare exception? And is there a possibility for cross species offspring? The answer is, that's up to each individual to roleplay. You currently find no official cross-species NPC relationships in the game. Rox and Bram are good friends. That's not to say we might not have one. one we might not one day have one. My initial uh, reaction to this was, please don't. But then I got thinking about it. <laughs> Uh-oh. While I was making dinner. And I guess when it's between sentient species, if they're capable of love, they're capable of love. So... Meh. <laughs> so at first I was like a bit, ew, no, please don't ever do that. And then I r- realized that was maybe being a little bit uh, closed-minded. <laughs> okay, let's say for cross-species offspring, please don't ever do that. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. And just by virtue of an MMO, that would, just, that would be a bag of hurt to open for character modeling. <laughs> yeah, the relationships and stuff like that. Hey, why not? Yeah. The next question is, who were Timey's parents? What is Zoja's role in Timey's education? And Bobby Stein replied, We intend to explore answers to both questions in the future stories. Stay tuned. Yeah, and I came up with a little theory. And this is seriously like tinfoil hat, guys. <laughs> we have a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if Timey is really just leading us on and she's really out for revenge against Scarlet for killing her parents, Dominova? It doesn't fit at all with Timey's character, but it's cool. Yeah. I actually, when, when I read your little tinfoil section there, I was like, ooh, not bad. It'd be interesting, but uh, I think. But is it? Okay. Somebody would I, have noticed. I agree it doesn't fit with her character, but it doesn't fit with the character she's presenting. And she's a smart little thing. So. This is true. I highly doubt it, but it would be kind of neat. It would be pretty cool. Do you have plans or would you consider adding a a prominent gay male couple to the world, not sectioned off into one Silvari personal story path, and additional prominent people of color, i.e. non-white human or Norn, to the world? Angel's reply was, absolutely, but we're not in any hurry to do it just to do it. We'll do it when the story calls for it. I think she's mostly just answering the first one. Yeah, I actually was thinking, it's like, well, isn't Bram supposed to be... I have no idea. That actually, I that had never occurred to me at all. Well, because I went back and and read Brahm's story again, which 
made me cry. Oh, yeah, that's why you tweeted that. <laughs> and his father is described as being very dark skinned. Oh, okay. So I was like, well, Apparently okay. I need to reread it. That kind of works, but you know, I I think she's responding more towards the gay male couple. Or I guess you could also take it to the Alona or Cantha. Yeah, that's true. Maybe at some point. Do it. Hopefully. Um, Do it next month. Yes, yes. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, flip that switch. Just do it. Yep. Uh, do you want to read the next one? Yeah, sure. Okay. What exactly was it that caused Sayy al-Rajid and Treherne to join forces the first time they met? Angel's response is a very frustrating, we're <laughs> keeping this story in our pocket for future potential releases. Yeah. Which makes sense because, I mean, the Largos and, and their obvious connection to Bubbles. Well, the Largos, the Quaggan, the who else? Karka? Perhaps the Karka? Was it proven that they were disturbed by a dragon or am I making that up? No, I think you're just thinking about the pheromones in Kanak. Could be. And that's what got them all riled up. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, basically the... <laughs> I'm voting for Bubbles being the next dragon. <gasps> No. Yes. <laughs> all underwater. Or at the very least, one that has a name. I would, oh, I would love to have an all underwater zone. I like underwater combat. Give those people with underwater legendaries a chance to shine. Right? Yeah. The next Doliac Express is going to be about audio production, and we'll have a link in the show notes in case you're interested in submitting your questions for that. Mm-hmm. There was an article on Massively, which I've entitled this entry, Massively article. Needs a much catchier title than this, but what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was like... So it was about the final battle for Lion's Arch beginning. And Anatoly Ingram talked to, I think it was Colin Johansson, mm -hmm. about the upcoming patch. And, and a little bit to recap the previous one. And so a couple of the points that they call out are feedback on the difficulty of citizen rescues in the current release led ArenaNet to reduce the number needed to receive the highest tier rewards. According to Johansson, the full event was intended to require roughly as much coordination as the Twisted Marionette encounter, but ended up being slightly overtuned. And I thought that was a good move. I hadn't really played a colossal amount before they made that switch, but I was glad they did. I've, I still have never got the max rewards. I was like five or 10 shy one time. It was very frustrating. Ooh. I've gotten the max twice, Yay. but I haven't gotten anything special from uh, doing that. So, yeah. Meh. But, you know, the more times you do it and the more you have, the better your chance you get something awesome. Exactly. Do you want to read that one? <laughs> <laughs> You're geared up for it. <laughs> Sharp intake of breath. Obviously, she wants to read that right now. <laughs> Another point that they shared was not only is the Dominion of Winds firmly closed against both Scarlet's Troop and fleeing refugees, but they aren't taking any chances. Anything or anyone approaching the gate is quickly wiped out by a rain of arrows. Understandably, this has caused some hurt feelings. Johansson acknowledged that this seemingly heartless move was in character for the Tengu. While their reaction to LA's destruction may not be heroic, Johansson described it as realistic and added that player reactions to this development have been really cool to watch. I should run up and get killed. There should be a hidden achievement for that. I think we mentioned that last week, too. <laughs> yeah, there really should be. <laughs> But, you know, my feelings were hurt, and I agree. Like, I love the fact that so far they're maintaining the Tengu party line. Like, Tengu do not want to be involved in any of our mess. I think it's going to take something really big to get the Tengu out from their city. Like, really big. You know, like a final battle. Wink. <laughs> or like a giant drill boring into the earth and destroying their walls. That's true, too. Yeah, I mean, I have no idea, obviously. And if the Tengu aren't an ultimate payoff for the end of the living world, I, I wouldn't be super disappointed. Because I kind of think they're coming eventually. Oh, yeah, it's going to happen eventually. It's I think we can all pretty much agree that it's just a matter of time. Yeah. And the next one we actually kind of talked about, so we can probably... Uh... He mentions that it's supposed to um, uncover story hints, the Atlas, but honestly, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of that going on with it. Yeah, although you, 
So yeah, ArenaNet has launched a new website called The Living World Atlas to let players explore the lore of the living world, unlock media, and even uncover story hints ahead of the next release. And you did point out that I, and I forgot about this, that the Watchwork Knight image mm-hmm. uh, was one of the, the things. And I actually wanted to talk about that uh, just a smidge because it's cropped weird, but it almost looks like it's flying with the back piece on. And I don't know whether that is just the way it's cropped and the position that it's in. Well, it does say wander, that it'll be something that's wandering on the Atlas page. So I'm thinking it's probably land. I wonder if it's that one that we talked about last week. <laughs> the potential of the one that we talked about last week. Perhaps. Brain, not brawn, will change the world. Ask an Asura. Question from the ever inquisitive M is for awesome. She asks, I think it would be neat if after this event the airship drifted Tyria on some kind of schedule so you never know where you will end up. It wasn't really a question per se, but it was a really interesting observation, I thought, and it made me think, like, how cool would it be if the airship moved around Tyria patch to patch? It wasn't in the same spot. It could be like the Zephyr Sanctum and roaming. Although the changes they have to make to the maps to have it there is the only thing I could think that might stop that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's actually built into the Gandaran Fields map area now. But still, like, it's an airship. It can fly. It can go different places. You know how the map has several layers. Oh. They could just put it on the topmost layer. That's interesting. Never thought of that. Yeah. It was kind of just an offhand comment in a way, but I thought, wow. That's actually a really interesting point. I think it'd be worth it. It'd be something that would make the captain's airship pass extra nice. Now, the permanent one's already gone from the trading post, but I don't know if if it was kept around as a permanent feature, a traveling permanent feature, or even just a permanent permanent. Do you think that they'll bring the permanent passes back on a temporary basis every once in a while? I have the feeling that they're kind of a one-time thing. You don't think that they'll bring them back, say, like, maybe once a year, like, 24 hours only, this is available? Well, I suppose so. Because, well, you have to think new players that weren't around, if it is around, their ship does this and gets to be known in the community, and if there's new players. Well, like the Queen's Terrace Pass, that was permanent, but it wasn't released until way after the Jubilee. Yeah, but I'm wondering how much of that was just a, you know what, what if we did this and charged the, like, I mean. Right, like testing the waters. Yeah. Like, I I wonder how much of it is. I mean, you could have the best ideas in the world, but sometimes further down, you kind of go, oh, wait a minute. What if we just did this small thing that's slightly different that still uses this? So it makes sense. I'm not sure I would get one because I do have the permanent rail terrace pass, but I know she she really wanted one and she missed buying it by one day. Oh. And she was bummed. Then I also wonder, the rail terrace passes, the two-week ones, they're not in the gem store right now, are they? No. I wonder if they come back at any point, if they'll sell them for the same price as the two-week airship ones. Possibly. Mm -hmm. They may be listed lower at that point. Yeah. Anyway, that's uh, a brief question for Ask and Azura this week. But still something interesting. Tales of Tyria. So Hunter's Insight has theoretical Scarlet Insights. Over on his site, uh, he has some theories on Scarlet, which I thought were quite interesting. And I'm just going to read a few of the pullouts from that. Okay, so obviously, spoiler alert, the entity Scarlet talks to must be a dragon. Obviously, we know that powerful entities like the Pale Tree have a cognitive presence in the Eternal Alchemy. We already suspect that the Pale Tree is a dragon minion. So what other creatures could be found and confronted there but dragons? And which dragon is this? I think the answer can be sussed out. Which dragon would have more of a connection with the Silvari than any other? The dragon that created the Pale Tree. The dragon of forests and jungles. Scarlet even mentions 
that whispers come from the forest. So in a word, Mordermoth. And I think that's that's a good makes a good case for Mordermoth over Primordus, which I was championing <laughs> for prior. I could totally see that. Like that I, that I put on the tinfoil hat. <laughs> because a lot of the stuff that arena net has sent out has said like you know tyria will burn not just lion's arch which obviously is burning right now but like tyria you know primordus is more the dragon of burning things and so i was thinking what if scarlet has not one but two dragons talking to her at the same time well that's certainly enough to make her insane it would be wouldn't it wow um not th- and not that she knows that there's two Total tinfoil hat. I highly doubt this is even a remote possibility. <laughs> but it was just like, ooh, sort of thought. That would be pretty insane. Yeah. And he said, obviously, there are some big spoilers floating around the ether. I've avoided them as best I can, but I'm sure some of this is already known to be wrong of what he wrote previously in the article. But personally, I think this is a lot more fun than already knowing the answers. And I give that a total plus one. I've managed to avoid all info leaks. And I love speculation, obviously. And I would rather speculate and be completely, totally wrong than know for sure and ruin the big reveal. Yeah, I'd hate to be spoiled. Yeah. And I'd just be so angry. So I'm definitely right there with y'all that I would just yeah. rather speculate to myself. And if somebody wants to tell me that one of my theories is wrong, awesome. But, but I don't so. want to know what's right. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, obviously, we just just gave a tiny tiny bit of of the article it it was it's a really good article i I recommend everyone go read it there will be a link in the show notes for it one of the awesome things that i found is that user reddish who did the initial oh gosh what was it it was like the fly through of all the different vistas has put together a before and after and it's just perfect yeah I like that he or she cuts the Vista flyover in half. So the first half of it is pre-attack and the post part is post-attack. I, I that's that is what is happening, right? Like I yes. was okay, yeah. I I thought that was really cool. I also really like that, you know, those two really big stone lions with the little tiny wings on their backs are still in place and not damaged at all. It's pretty awesome. That was the one thing I noticed there. But it definitely gives you a good idea of the scope of the destruction. Like, I mean, when you're running around, you see that the whole place is burning all around you, but you don't really notice the little things that are gone unless you're looking for something specific. Mm-hmm. So it's really pretty cool that somebody managed to put this together and yeah, to show how stark it truly is. I remember thinking, I meant to mention this last week, how I was shocked by how much devastation they actually applied to Lion's Arch. Oh, yeah. And so, and this, again, shows that. It was very cool. Actually, and I was glad because, I'm glad he did because I haven't had time to watch any of the Vistas. (laughs) The only one that I saw actually was the one out near the ship bridge. And that was because I just managed to get to where I was on the path towards it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh. Well, I'm going to go ahead and check it out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I've seen any of them. I think I did the Ermog's Revenge or Ermog's Cave. Secret? Yeah. Jumping puzzle yesterday because it was for the jumping puzzle for the daily and it was still the fastest, easiest one to get to. In yeah. The <laughs> so I'm like, all right, tell a few people to get out, do a jumping puzzle. <laughs> Pretty much. But it's, uh, it's definitely worth looking at. Another really cool thing is that somebody managed to capture a 60 frame per second GIF or JIF, if you prefer that particular pronunciation of GIF. I've never heard JIF before. That is, (laughs) did you just make that one up? No, it's a thing that I got on PBS Ideal Channel, actually. But uh, yeah. I thought it was GIF or GIF was the big argument. It was, yes. But this particular person decided that it should be. Jife. <laughs> I could start calling him that. That's a really good Jife. It's a wonderful Jife. <laughs> but it's not going to show up too clearly on the live stream specifically, but it is 60 frames per second and the animation is as smooth as butter. Yeah. And I, my, my thought that popped into my brain when I was watching it was like, it's sad when GIFs have better frame rates than my actual game. <laughs> It's better than the frame rates on my game, actually. Uh, But it just, it looks beautiful. And they link over to the tool so that you can make your own if you like. But it's just, it's so cool. Yeah. 
And to close out, there have been new amazing items in the gem store added. And uh, one of them is Magnus's eye patch. Yar! So for 400 gems, and you can get a left or... Do you get left or right? I'm, I can't remember which, but you... Depending on your hairstyle, if they... I thought it was a good move, because if there were only, like, one available, and if your hair covered it, there'd be no point. Right. Depending on what works best for your character, you can use the left or right eye patch, and it has two die slots, and it actually looks really cool. It actually has some texture and design to it. It's not just, like, a big, like, plunk something tossed yeah. out of your eye. And uh, the, so that's 400 gems. And the other item is the permanent Thresher Sickle 5000 for 1,000 gems. And... Damn you, Arena Nut. <laughs> it is quite cute. It's adorable, and I have always told myself that for all the permanent ones, I'm going to get at least one of each one. <laughs> <sighs> they got me. They got you good. When you lay it down, a, a barrel shows up, and then little golem arms poke out either side, and it spins around really fast while it's harvesting the plants, and then it gets dizzy and falls over. <laughs> That's really cute. It is really cute. I guess it's better than going golfing for plants. Yeah. And uh, I didn't um, have it in the show notes here, but the other thing they made mention of really quickly is that the Love Struck weapon skins are only available for one Black Line claim ticket. Uh, they said for one week only when they posted that. So I presume that they mean until the patch goes live next Tuesday. Right. And then after that, I don't know what it'll go up to. Um, if they're really popular, it could go up to seven, like the flamey, molten, fused ones. Right. But I think most of them tend to just go up to five. Well, I'm hoping it stays at five because seven is pretty steep. I'm surprised that that one is still at seven, to be honest. But yeah. There's, and there's one that's only at three, and I can't remember what it is. Hmm. So I thought that was interesting. But in any event. You guys have plenty of stuff to check out in the store this week. Yeah. If you have a community event that you would like for us to share, please send us an email. And if you have a burning question for our Ask an Azurin segment, let us know. And now is the time in our show where we go ahead and talk about our sponsor. Our first sponsor is Doghouse Systems. If you use the coupon code MMRreporter at doghousesystems.com, they will double your RAM on a new uh, PC or laptop. And Audible, if you go to audibletrial.com slash MMRreporter, you will get your first month free. That's right. Now, Alona, if people want to get in touch with us, what are some of the many ways that they would be able to do so? They can email us at gwreporter at mmoreporter.com. Visit us on Twitter at gwreporter. Go to our website at guildwarsreporter.com. Leave us a voicemail at 616-666-6778. Or they can use the widget on the right-hand side of the website. They can visit our YouTube channel at MMO Reporter Network, Facebook page at Guild Wars Reporter, Tumblr is guildwarsreporter.tumblr. Oh, wait, sorry, gwreporter.tumblr.com. If you go to guildwarsreporter.tumblr.com, it doesn't exist. You can visit Collegium's Guild website at collegium gw2.guildlaunch.com, or you can visit us on Twitter individually. And I am at one big pair. And I am at Seliuki. Yay! And finally, you can tune into the live stream like our ever so lovely chat room has been at twitch.tv slash mlreporter every Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. EST or 6.30 p.m. PST. That's right. That was a wonderful show. It was. It actually didn't seem as long as... As we thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. That happens. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to our chat room for sticking by with us. And thank you, Alona, for coming and helping me to report all of the wonderful news. Yay, reporting wonderful news. <laughs> with you. <laughs> Aww. Aww. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> uh, we hope that you enjoyed the show. We hope that you will download our episode again next week. But most importantly, we hope to see you in game. 